This is an oral history interview for the Echoes of the Decade project for the Culture Division of Donegal County Council. Today is the 5th of November 2020. My name is Regina Fitzpatrick and today I will be speaking with Helen Meehan. We're recording our interview on the phone as current COVID-19 restrictions prevent us from meeting in person, unfortunately. Um, so, Helen, thanks a million for giving me your time this morning. I really appreciate it. Helen, we'll start off. Um, you've you've uh, spent uh, a lifetime really researching various aspects of the history of, um, of history and in particular the history of Donegal. Um, so first of all, can you just tell me um, a little bit about where you're from and what type of place that is? And then maybe we'll move on to um, the history research you have done in, in that area. Yeah, I was born Helen Montgomery in uh, Ballybrillahan, outside Frosses in the south Donegal, near Donegal town in 1937. I was the eldest of a family of seven. Uh, I always say I got my interest in history and in the past from my late father, Robert Montgomery. He, I suppose I had an unusual type of childhood from this point of view, that my father neither drank nor smoked, and he stayed at home at night. He didn't go out playing cards, and he read for us, and he talked about the current affairs. The paper was got every day. And I uh, got interested in all this I'd like to be able to talk to him about it. I was at Frost's National School. Uh, then I was uh, got the preparatory examination, and I was spent four years in uh, College de Breja. It was run by the Loretto nuns. I was there from 1951 to 55, and we got a very broad education there. And I have great time for the nuns. And I, then I got to Caeries for Training College. And I graduated there in um, First Division in 1957. I taught for three years in the Loretto Convent in Dublin, North Great Georgia Street, in the National School part. And then in uh, May of 1960, the local school here in Frosses became vacant, and I applied, and I got it. I came home then, and uh, three years later, I married uh, John Meehan, and I came to live here in Coulomb uh, as, as, as what I always call it, his ancestral home. Um, I was interested, when I came home, I joined the Donegal Historical Society and I went to their field days and I began doing some research. But then after I got married, well, I had very little time with school, family, building up the farm here. And I... Um, didn't get, didn't really, I suppose, do anything apart from going to the odd field day and reading the annual and that type of thing. Then, about 1983, uh, the Donegal Historical started running uh, or revamped a schools competition they were doing, and we, I got the children to enter and we won. So from that on, we did the competition every year, and of course, to keep the competition going, I began doing more research. The family by this were sort of growing up, or I had more time. Then I was asked to do a field day on the area. I did that. Then I was asked to write it up. I wrote that up for the Donegal Annual. And about that time, um, in Mount Charles, there was a, a group running at, uh, an event called the Seamus and McManus, in honour of Seamus McManus. I joined that. Then I had to do talks. And sort of my history career, shall we call it, uh, moved on from there. Uh, as I was asked to write for the Donegal Annual, then I got to know editors of other annuals. I wrote then for Due North, Belfast, and the Skillin, the Spark, and uh, was up at the Ballymena Arts Festival talking one year, and things just seemed to snowball. Then, in, uh, when I, after I retired, I retired in 1998, I began seriously collecting for my history of, uh, and, uh, for the parish. And I called the book and the parish in history because I wanted to place our parish in the broader context of the na local, national and international scene. Later, I wrote uh, a biography of Ethnic Carberry, whom I'll mention later, and I updated uh, Geoffrey Duffy's um, 
registration your Donegal ancestors. I also was asked to have contributed to the uh, Atlas of County Donegal and to the Diction of, Dictionary of Irish Biography. So I just keep going, and there's always something. We have three history groups in the parish at the moment, the G-Shirt and the Blue Stacks. We have the Mount Charles Heritage Group and a group to, uh, who hope to get on the setting up to uh, an Inver to do something about the old Abbey there. I'm also, uh, in the past, I've been pre- president of the Donegal Historical Society. Uh, I'm a treasurer of it at the moment. I'm an Ulster Federation. And anything that seems to be going on the history line, I seem one way or another to um, help the anniversaries of various schools and uh, churches, especially the non-Catholic churches. I've written for them all. So there's always something. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> and when when you were s- s- t- talking about your father had an interest in history as well, was there yeah. was there a particular period in history that um, he was interested in and that he would have, I suppose, talked to you about or um, you would have heard about from an earlier age? Well, from a point of view, he would talk about the revival times, what he would have heard about it. But he was very broad-minded and he was very interested in the history of um, the plantation of Ulster. And he would have a much more balanced view of that than most people locally would have had at the time. And where do you think that came from in him? Would he have grown up in a household where there were books and there was reading and maybe discussion well, about those yeah, things? His people, yeah, his people would have uh, been a bit, uh, yeah. Uh, I would think that, that very much so now, yeah. And did, so is that the, and, and you were saying that his, um, he would have been more open-minded on, on that period of history than other people around um, that might have been. Was there... Yeah, oh, he yeah. would have, uh, like he was a Fianna Fáil supporter, but mm-hmm. he could often talk about the destruction the Civil War caused and how much it cost the state. You know, he could look at the two sides. Yeah. And would he talk, to, would he have spoken with you much? I know that he was, he was young at the, during that period of 1916 and the War of Independence. I, I, I think he told me before he was born in 1907. Yeah. Um, so he was, he was, you know, a child when all of that was happened. When well, a young happened, teenager, but, too young to be involved, like, you know. Yes. Yeah. But, would he have had stories that, or would he have memories, though, of that period that he might have shared with you? Oh, he would. He would talk about things, yes, he would, yeah, and phrases he would use from the time off, like, you know. For example, I'll talk about, maybe later, they'll talk about the flying column, anyone went away in a hurry or anything. People at that time were going off to England and places, not letting not, n- them know at home, and then the story would go around the place that such and one, such and one had gone to England, and they didn't know when my father would say they left the country like the flying column. Yeah. So all these phrases sort of lived on, you know, those kind of turns of phrase. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 Um, and can you tell me a little bit about your, so your, the, the household your father um, would have grown up in? Um, maybe a little bit if you, if you knew his parents or if you. If yeah, you know. well, uh, yeah, my grandmother was still alive. Uh, my grandmother, she was Conwell. Her people were originally Kelly Beggs. Uh, my father, he was Robert Montgomery. His father was Robert Montgomery. Uh, our, uh, we could trace, uh, I would have to say that uh, our family were Catholic for five generations. Um, uh, we couldn't go any further. We're the only, uh, apart from another family who were cousins, we had no, there were no other Catholic Montgomerys in the area or anywhere around. Uh, my father said, but then I don't record it because I have no documentary proof that uh, his, um, there, there's the uh, local family in, uh, the, in Drumbeg, they were the landlords, and uh, there was a missing Robert in the records, and uh, my father said somebody turned was the word, and of course the penalty for that was you were uh, kicked out, shall we say, uh, you were disowned, disinherited, 
and uh, you'd uh, the phrase in the history books you disappeared among the peasantry. And uh, my father uh, said that that's what he believed. Uh, nobody was blaming him. That was the way in the rules at the time. But we could trace ourselves back, and it fitted in with that. But having said it, I don't. I haven't written it because, as I say, there's no documentary proof. Catholic registers don't go back that far. And uh, once you were disowned and disinherited, uh, you disappeared from peerage books and every other type of uh, book of the kind. So there's, as I say, no documentary proof. Oh my goodness. Mm. And when do you <clears throat> when do you suspect that that might have happened? Well, uh, the earliest record of the Montgomerys in the rent, Cunningham rent roll is about 1820 and roughly fits in with that. And the Montgomerys would have been the landlords around Drumbeg at that time? They were. They had an estate here. They would have come. They came over at the dawn of what was known as the dawn of the Ulster Scots. And would would there have been, um, I suppose, cousins and descendants that, that uh, stayed within the official family, if you like, of the Montgomery? Oh, not really. They would have moved away. What were left okay. would have long moved away in our time, you know. Uh, but there's a clan Montgomery in America. They have a journal and I write for them. I've done quite a bit of research and have uh, published a good bit of stuff in their journal in America. Okay, okay. Yeah. And what would your um, your grandfather on that side then, what would have been, what did uh, he do for a living? Well, they were all farmers. They're all farmers, yeah. Farmers, yeah. Mm-hmm. And your mother's, fa- your... Uh, My mother's name was Gallagher. Her people were quite um, AOH, Finn Gale background. They were farmers as well. Yeah. And would the ancient order of Hibernians have been strong in that area, um, Helen? Well, they were strong up to the... Uh, they were the only show in town, really, until the volunteers about 1913. I'll mention that in the actual history, why sort of that day. And then there's some, many went over to the nationalist or the uh, side while, all the, while um, some remained at yes. uh, AOH and uh, were most, would have been Finn Gale supporters. I see, I see. Okay. Mm. And so the, the, the Gallaghers then, they would have come from what part of Donegal? Sorry, did you they mention? They were just from the other side of Frosses, <laughs> the land, Bally McCall. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So all around the same area. Yeah. Very good. Um. And did you know your uh, your mo- your gran- your family on your mother's side uh, going back? Oh yeah, I did. That yeah, yeah. Um, your actually, my f- grandfather and grandmother were both Gallaghers. Uh, um, I knew them well. Uh, they lived on. I was married before either of them died, and um, when I was a child, we went over there a lot. Uh, my uncle was near 40 when he got married, the man that lived on at home. So my grandmother was used to say getting on an age at that time and we often went over to help uh, help her with the housework, go to the shop for her, take the eggs to the shop for her and that type of thing. And uh, my grandfather would talk a good bit there about politics and that too. <laughs> and I would be trying to think up answers. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd go home and I'd be telling my father what he said. And my father would be saying he didn't say this or you could have said that. <laughs> so you're kind of political aware, like, you know. Yeah, you seem these. to have it from both sides, yes. Uh, they they were quite political aware, now I must say, yeah. And your grandparents then um, on the, the Gallagher side, uh, around what, would you know around what year they would have been born or what, you know? Oh, well, if I could time to think of it, I would. Um, yeah. No, okay. They were married about 1910, so they would have been born about, I suppose, 18, in the 1880s, shall we say, I suppose. Yeah. So mm. they, they would have had a lot of, um, they would have, ex- have you know, experienced the, you know, that period uh, as adults, you know, that period. of. Oh, they would have yeah. lived through it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And would they have had any stories that they might have told you about that time as well, Helen? Or well, their stories you see would be different somewhat from with a different slab. They would tell there was a shootout, as they used to call it, at the time of the Civil War, quite close to them. And uh, my grandmother, we always said how terrible it was. There were weed and potatoes, and they had to all stay down in the d- shocks, as we called them, in the red between the ridges, in case they'll be shot. And that was kind of their main or chief memory of the time. So, she, so that was she remembers seeing that she was trying. She oh was yeah, they were, she was living there at the time. Yeah, she, I don't know was she out in the field or was the rest of them in the field or what exactly. But uh, you know that was kind of what she complained about the terrible time. And in terms of the the history of that period in or around Frosses, um, you know, in the course of your research for you know. Um, Inver Parish in history and and your other research for articles and everything as well. What would you have learned about um, that particular area during the period of 1912 to 23 around that time? Well, it wouldn't like there wasn't great activity comparing areas in the south and other areas. You know, there wouldn't have been a huge level of activity either in, in War of Independence, what I normally call the Tan War, or the Civil War. Not now, maybe to the extent of some, you know, but there was a certain level, uh, and the uh, Tans, uh, they like, you know, a lot of talk about them ransacking houses, and, you know, the, of course, the point about that was they, ne- they never did our house at home. And the reason was they would have a list of the names, and my grandfather, as well as my father, he was Robert Montgomery. So they assumed he was a Protestant, so the house was never uh, touched at all. My goodness. My goodness. Yeah. But other houses, all the other houses in the area all would have been All the other raided. houses up the road and down the road and every other road around, they mm-hmm. were all visited. They came looking for just general annoyance and especially for looking for men that were in the movement. Mm-hmm. And that was how the phrase, the flying column, came in. People who were the men who were in the movement couldn't sort of live at home. And they had to move around a series of safe houses. And uh, that's where they got the name, the flying column, that my father used to refer to. Mm-hmm. And where were the uh, black and tan stations locally to, to that area? Well, uh, well, there was a Donegal town mm-hmm. and uh, there was another in Kelly Beggs and then the police barracks in Mount Charles and the small places like that, they were evacuated eventually. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the RIC barracks in the area, would there have been, up up to that period, to your knowledge, would there have been a good relationship between uh, the There was a fair the relationship between and... them and the local population. Mm-hmm. In fact, a lot of them got married to girls from the area and that, and some of them were Catholic and... You know, I would say now they didn't uh, personally know all the people out in the country, but uh, they would, you know, mix in the town and their name would come up on, you know, meetings and things. They seemed to, you know, get on all right. Yeah. And, and with families, like local families, their sons had been, you know, were going into the police force and probably more would have it was a career and. Respectable mm-hmm. carry year. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And would there have been, in terms of the, I suppose, the demographic of that area, um, Helen, would there have been a, a large Protestant population or was it you know, very predominantly Catholic at that time? Well, it depends on, you see, the parish stretches from Inver Bay, from Donegal Bay up to the Blue Stack Mountains. And along the bay and down in the peninsula called Duran, it would be very planted. There'll be townlands there. There'll be, I would say, most of the land selling in non-Catholic hands. Uh, but then as you moved on up toward the hills and, of course, up in the upper part of the parish altogether, there'll be no non-Catholics at all. So uh, the, kind of demographically, the um, non-Catholic population have inclined to move on down towards the shore. And uh, the, the, the parish would be... Now, there's, um, there's two Church of Ireland and a Methodist church in the parish. And there's four Catholic churches. So that kind of would explain the demographics. Yes, yes. Uh, the Protestant population has remained fairly steady because one of the things I notice now is that um, 
of uh, even they're working off for them. They're very inclined to build on their own land and live on their, on their own land. They haven't taken up this moving into living the towns or the council estates on the edges of towns to the same extent as Catholics. Okay, so that's so that's kept the you know the population yeah, kept, rural almost. You know. Yeah. 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 And and I suppose going into this period, you don't see it written much, but I do notice yeah. it. Like, yeah. And would there moving in towards local towns? Then would uh, a lot of the businesses and everything have been Protestant owned, or was it sort of you know inconsequential really at that stage? Donegal town especially would have been very much so, mm-hmm. but then more as time has gone on, the numbers have gone down in the. Catholics have taken over a lot of the businesses. Of course, now I, I, I Lidl and Aldi, now we're going to take them over. Yes. <laughs> and if you, I suppose I'm just wondering, going into this period, what the relationship would have been like between uh, Catholics and Protestants and Methodists, you know, what the relations would have been like between faiths in the in the area? The relations were quite good. There was no history of animosity. But uh, people, I suppose, would be more inclined to socialise with their own. And until more recent times, of course, marriages, uh, cross-community marriages didn't go down well. But otherwise, like farm work and helping each other out and that, now there was very good relations. So there was, there was that sense of kind of, you know, but helping out with the trash or, or whatever. No, uh, I suppose through schools and through, war, you know, uh, you would help out their own, I suppose, first, like, you know. Yes, yes. And in in uh, Frost's, who would have been, the? would there have been a, a landlord in that area well, coming uh, up to this period? The parish would be divided. The eastern side of the parish was part of the Cunningham State. That's the yes. family now of Slane Castle and County Meath. The Mount Charles. They were very big landlords. Okay. Uh, west of the, the western side of the parish, there was a couple of town lands off, but otherwise it was a small estate, and it originally was the Montgomery estate up till 1848. Then they, released, they died out, Reverend Alexander had no family. And um, then the Sinclairs, who were related to the girls, shall we say, uh, they moved in then. Their main residence was Holly Hill in Sudan. And uh, then the places both was, were bought out under the Wyndham Act of 1903. So it was quite a while before, uh, you know, all the paperwork was done, shall we say. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And and so at the end of the 19th century, um, I suppose that period of kind of land agitation and everything that was happening around the country um, would th- that particular part of Donegal have been badly affected at that time? I suppose I'm wondering about the relationship between the local Catholic population and th- and landlords in or around there, in or around, coming up to you know I- I- at the end of the, the 19th the, century. We hadn't the great divide between you know that around the Donegal Bay area here that you had in the northwest of the county. There was great writings up about the sheep war and Gidor and the Clochanele all for day. That was all in the north northwest of the county. We had nothing that uh, important in this area here. We had a branch of the Land League and, you know, if any organisation was going, it was founded. But there wasn't the same animosity, uh, you know, as would have been in other areas. Mm. And and so I suppose in terms of the the recent history of of the uh, leading up to the to the revolutionary period as they call it, um, there it wouldn't have been a, a massively political. There wouldn't be a no, massive amount wasn't. of political it, agitation. No, it wouldn't feature at all. Yeah. And that's what I said about when I was writing my Inver uh, Parish in history. Mm. We were sort of sandwiched in between Donegal Town on one side, which, you know, was the main town in the area. And then down the road we had Kelly Beggs. It was a naval port and, uh, you know, fishing port. And we were sort of in between the two and there wasn't a, a lot written about us. You know, travellers yeah. and tourists and people just passed through and that was that. Mm. 
it was only when I started doing all the research I realised, you know, that there was a lot more to things than was generally thought. Yes, yes. And so I suppose, uh, aside from, I suppose, the social and the religious and, you know, uh, the political maybe, economically then it was, it's a it's a farming area, obviously the fishing down towards Killy Beggs as well, those were the main industries would they have been of that particular area? Yeah, well at that time or back up until recently, the Inver itself was a, as big a fishing place as Killy Beggs. Okay, okay. Yes. But just between the congested districts board and later, mm. now the U and that, the Killy Beggs has become a huge fishing place and Inver has declined. Though a lot of the Inver people would work in Killy Beggs, actually. Yes, yeah. Mm. Would would there have been a lot of, um, I suppose, in in the early at the turn of the the nineteenth to twentieth century, w- would would there have been a lot of poverty in the area? Would it have been a relatively well, okay? It wouldn't have been one of those areas you read about. Mm. Uh, you know, there's an account somewhere about the war where they had only um, so many rakes and so many forks and so many this and that. Uh, it wouldn't have been that poor of an area. But at the same time, it wasn't affluent or, you know. Yeah. But it wouldn't have been an area of huge deprivation. Mm-hmm. And would the, the farming that would have been conducted around that time around the area, would it have been predominantly sort of tillage farming or...? What? Well, that again depended. Uh, it would have been a lot more tillage than now. Uh, like the, There's an account... Forget now, I haven't checked it out, but it would have been, I think, around the time of a Donovan survey. And uh, like it, the, the, what area or what uh, percentage or what fraction of a town land was arable and which wasn't, or was cultivated and which wasn't. And again, you had that divide. You had along the coast, and especially the planted areas, you did not a lot there of cultivation. And then as you moved back up toward the mountains, well, there could be more sheep than that. Like, and of course, there were town lands up there where had nearly no land that was very good for cultivation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, in terms, then, I suppose of the, um, if we kind of head into uh, politically how things were then leading into the nineteen tens, what organisations would have been active? Uh, was it still sort of basically the ancient order of Hibernians were the only sort of show in town or, you know? Um... If you like now, I can uh, do uh, sort of the political background or what was happening on the political scene at the time, if that's OK. That sounds great. Great. Thanks, yeah. Helen. Yeah. Well, we'll say toward the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, the, uh, most of the majority of the people would have been the supporters of home rule and um, been members of the um, and some of them would have been members of the AOH but the vast majority of people were in favour of home rule the non catholics weren't but it hadn't come to the fore yet um, but there was always a strand of republicanism in the area from the time of Wolf Tone uh, and uh, it was from these people that uh, the Gaelic revival uh, gathered momentum. Of course, historians say it's hard to know when the Gaelic revival started. Was it due to the GAA? Was it due to the uh, writings or wh- whatever? But um, locally, uh, the, G- uh, the revival uh, depended a lot on just a few people. And one of the most important in that was a man called Seamus McManus. Now, Seamus was a local. He had become a teacher and he had back teaching in the local school. And when the first branches of the um, Gaelic League were founded, he became secretary of the branch in Donegal Town. There was a club in Mount Charles called the the Oshin Club, a kind of cultural group, and he was very active in that. It was called Cross Community. Uh, Seamus, as well as being active in these, was also writing. Uh, collecting legends and stories and writing as well. And one of the publications he wrote for was called the Shan Van Vogt, and it was published in Belfast and by two girls, uh, Alice Milligan and Ethna Carberry. Now, Ethna Carberry was the pen name of the writer born Anna Johnson. 
Uh, her people were uh, originally Macshan, but had been translated in the north, in the area into Johnston. And they originally came for, from Crebelli near Slemish Mountain outside Bellamina. They moved, uh, there's a long history. In fact, some of the family were involved in the 1798. But they eventually uh, moved into Belfast. And uh, that's where uh, Ethna grew up. Her father had set up as a businessman in construction. He moved from that into wholesale. And by the time she was a teenager, a young girl, the family were very wealthy. They had sawmills and all types of things, and agents in America seen to import and timber and all that type of thing. Uh, they were very a nationalist-minded family, and it was a kind of a their home was a place where people of like mind gathered in a kind of a culture hub as well. And they were into, very much into different societies like the Gaelic League, the Kickham Society, Amnesty, and I forget what all societies in Belfast. And that, um, as well as being interested uh, in the political societies around home, Seamus McManus was also involved in the INTO, the Teachers' Organisation, which was then only in its early days. And he was appointed delegate to the Congress in Belfast in 1896. And because he was already writing to F, he was invited to their home. And that's the first time that he met he met F. Now then, um, then at that time you're coming up to the commemoration of 1798, and clubs and organisations were set up over the country to you know to commemorate the men of the United Irishmen. And uh, the first uh, one in County Donegal was uh, established in Mount Charles and Seamus and his brother Patrick, who was home from the Argentina, another patriot, patriot shall we say, they organised a huge celebration in Mount Charles. Now, the Henry Joy McCain Society in Belfast, they had started as well a thing called Decoration Day to decorate the graves of the Patriot dead. And there was a big uh, day organised in Donegal Town, and uh, the day chosen was the uh, date of uh, Wolf Tone's birthday in June. I just can't remember the exact date. And um, there was a huge celebration in Donegal Town, and the Mancharis band, organised by Seamus, and uh, they w went and laid wreaths on the graves, and, of course, it was mentioned that they laid the wreath for the four masters, uh, where the annals at that time, it was believed, were written. Of course, now they say they weren't written there at all. They were written up in County, up in Leitler. But that time of organisation was kind of all. Seamus was organising all these type of things. Now, um, the Gaelic League in Belfast felt as well that the best way to... Uh, Further, the Gaelic cause was to organise competitions, fish or fish enough for more than one. And in the uh, autumn of September, I think it was, of 1898, they came to South Donegal to do that. They had a big day in Barnesmore Gap, just inside the gap here. There was a Richard Bonner organised that, a full day on a, th on a Friday. On the Saturday, they had uh, went to Gentys and they organised competitions there. And um, Ethnic Arbery and uh, presented the prizes. That was her first visit to Donegal. Then the following day, they had, went round the Fint Town and they had um, dancing and all type of outdoor activities after Mass. They had a rambling night that night. And they had gave the area a kind of prominence. It was written up in the nationalist-minded papers and that type of thing. Now, um, can, can I ask you, Helen, in or yeah. around that time, would there have been much Irish spoken in that area or any, a lot of native speakers? Uh, only and only very much up in the blue stack. Okay. Only very much now up there. Most of the, <coughs> the Irish just disappeared, <coughs> taken from down at the coast from the time of the plantation. Uh, English came in there, moved up, you know, time by time. Uh, but the famine would have been quite a cut-off point. Uh, that's a point in the 1901 census. 
uh, it is written, you know, it was one of the questions was, could you speak Irish? And then could they, any, you know, who could speak Irish in a family? And it came out that in all the townlands around us, uh, the, the people weren't speaking Irish themselves, but the grandparents knew Irish. And the only family that didn't know Irish, the grandparents, was the Montgomery's. And I remember an old man saying to me, they never could get their tongue round it. <laughs> wow, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the so, uh, Seamus was coming in when he was, I suppose, you know, being involved in the Gaelic League and um, activities around that. He, he, he wasn't raised through Irish himself. Oh, no, he wasn't. But then there's a difficulty. You see, some people... Um, he, it is written, he said himself, about some meeting he was at in Donegal Town. He wasn't speak, able to speak in Irish. He apologised, but he hoped by going to Gaelic classes that he would be able the next time. And the way classes were, Gaelic League was running classes and that. Mm. But um, then, because he would have some Irish phrases and wrote things a bit in English and the Irish idiom, shall we say, there'd be people now trying to make out he was an Irish speaker, you know. But Oh, from himself and his people and living so close to them. I just know he wasn't, you know. But you get people who are very fanatical trying to make out, yes. you know, that he was. But there wasn't Irish, wasn't spoken. There was a, there'll be old people, say, maybe from the mountain area would be married down here in the, you know, where it wasn't Irish speaking. And if two women from those areas happened to get together, they would speak in Irish themselves. But... It's a pity, of course, nobody at the time seemed to thought you could be bilingual. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, there are accounts of that now here and there of people, you know, that were from that area if they met some of their co-patriots at Mass or something, they would chat in Irish to them. But otherwise, I mean, an Irish-speaking family, uh, I say a woman married into an English-speaking family, she couldn't turn them into being Irish-speaking. Yes, you know, yes. that was just wasn't... Yeah. That's just the way things went. So the stories that Seamus was collecting from people, um, cha you know, it it was sort of collecting the, the folklore and the stories as I suppose to maybe documenting the language, that, that the Irish that was spoken. Yeah, it'd be, yeah. yeah. I would, yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you, Helen. I just wanted to... No, that's OK. Uh, give yes. me a breath or two to think of what... Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, then the 98... Uh, commemoration in the party in the diocese of Rafael, Cardin uh, Bishop later Cardinal O'Donnell was a great man behind the revival, and uh, a young and energetic bishop, and he was having the St Eunan's Cathedral in Letterkenny built at the time, and he had an idea of uh, having a 98 commemoration, uh, have organised what was called a nena or a fe uh, gathering, uh, in Letterkenny. And it would be to gather funds, of course, for the for the cathedral. But it was also to sort of uh, promote the Gaelic revival and to get the best of you know show off the best of Irish culture, manufacture, and get the congested district board was had come to the area at the time, and they were promoting knitting and embroidery and that type of home craft. Like, and he organised the Aina, and uh, they had. Uh, it was the first time that a play was actually seen theatre in uh, in the area. Uh, the, um, drama as a literary medium was unknown in Gaelic literature, but uh, somebody translated a, a, a kind of patriotic play, The Common of Connell, it was about the time of St. Patrick, and that was put on at the Aena, and it was sort of the first time that uh, drama I came in as a medium and to the Irish culture. Uh, Anthony Carberry and um, Alice Mulligan, they came from Belfast with the Ga Belfast Gaelic League and they would be organising and organise uh, sorting about costumes and things like that. You know, things that kind of just weren't on the agenda, shall we say. And was that drama... Really at all. Was that drama put on as part of the centenary celebrations of... Yeah, it was, yeah. Okay, uh, the Passing of Connell, it was called. Mm -hmm. It was actually written by Father O'Growney, and then uh, some of uh, it was translated into Irish and music, except it would be somebody else. And it was a whole. Uh, I have written about it in uh, some article for I think it was for the centenary of uh, 
Letter Kenny Cathedral. And this is the Father O'Growney of Simple Lessons in Irish fa- Oh, yeah, fame. the Gaelic League. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. OK. So all this Gaelic, Seamus McManus, was in, he was involved in so much uh, Gaelic type of activities that, of course, he had come to the notice of the uh, RIC, the authorities. He had also come for big time to the attention of the school inspectors. And uh, the curriculum, of course, was very rigid at the time. Uh, there was no Irish history taught. There was no uh, uh, poems, say, anything patriotic uh, was excluded from the curriculum. And it was discovered, of course, that Seamus was teaching some things that he shouldn't, they didn't think he should be teaching. So he was being uh, watched big time by the inspectors. And uh, he knew by their attitude that he would never get promoted from being a third class, the teachers were divided out somehow that thing. Uh, he would never get past that. So he was offered a job by a journal, a, a Paris journal, the Tite journal it was called, to interview the Irish organisations in America. So he gave up his school in Mount Charles and went to America. And of course locally that was considered, well, people couldn't believe it, that anybody would give up a good job like being a schoolmaster to go to America. And um, he went to America and he took his notebooks of stories and legends with him and went round the main publishing houses in New York and got his material published. Now, he had a good time for that because the first generation of Irish families of the famine immigrants had come growing up and some of them prospered, they were good, going well. And they were very interested in anything at all they could find out about Ireland. So this type of story went down very well. And Seamus was fit to come home in less than two years. And um, people, of course, couldn't believe it that time if he came home once or twice in a lifetime from America after being years there was great. So he had come into such riches so quickly. And uh, he joined up, of course, immediately again with the people in the Gaelic movement and um, uh, ethnic Carberry. And he and Ethna were married in 1901 in Belfast. Ethna came to live in Donegal. They rented, a, while the house was being done up for them in Mount Charles, uh, they uh, leased a house called Revlin in, outside Donegal town. But their life together was very brief. Ethna died at Easter, 2nd of, July, 2nd of April, 1902. And she's buried in Frosses. Her funeral was one of the few made the national press. People from Dublin, from all over, had come at a time when people didn't travel to funerals the way they do now. And what happened um, to her, Helen? Well, it, it, uh, TB. It was mm-hmm. consumption, it was called at the time. I think her father said the wet climate didn't help her, Donegal. She would... Uh, that was... And, she, was um, she was very young when she died. Well, she wasn't that young when she was married. She was in her 30s, mm-hmm. you know. So um, then Seamus, he didn't stay at, at home. as much. He wrote that he was too lonely at home and he would spend a good bit of time in Dublin, um, again, writing for Arthur Griffiths papers and different things like that. And in that way, he met um, Sean McDermott. And Sean McDermott, he was a nationwide organiser for the Gaelic League and through him he met Patrick Pierce. Now uh, one of the things he kind of was prominent in was what became known as the Battle of the Rotunda and briefly uh, the Parliamentary Party were having a con- their annual, annual conference or whatever in uh, the Rotunda and uh, Maud Gawne was very active on the national scene and uh, she uh, organ- decided it would be great publicity for their cause if they could interrupt the proceedings. So she gathered up the main supporters. One of them was Seamus. He was sent, got someone from Donegal by telegram, it said. And uh, they got up on the stage and interrupted the proceedings, and a fracas broke out. And it said that Seamus bodily carried Maud gone off the stage. Uh mm-hmm. Then there was another big event in the um, two years later in the Rotunda when about for the Gaelic League, and Seamus was there again representing Donegal, and it was accompanied that time by another Mount Charles man outside the town, uh, Cahir Healy. Uh, he was then a young journalist in, in Skillen, 
and uh, he became very prominent on the national scene later. And it was through him, partly, of course, that Seamus would have got to know um, Sean McDermott, because Sean McDermott was from Leithrim, and he often stayed in Healy's house, coming and going uh, on his rounds, going round Ireland. And again, that then led him in sort of to more contact with uh, Patrick Pearce. Now, one of the things that Pierce was there and the Gaelic League were very interested in was um, having Irish taught in the schools. And there was a college set up down in the Gaelic in the northwest of the county for to sell, we call it to teach the teachers. And uh, Pierce uh, went there in 1906, and when he went there again in 1907, he decided to sort of visit around the county and visit the schools and see uh, what could be done to further the teaching of Irish in schools. And I won't go over the whole of the county, but he, mm-hmm. in the south here along the Donegal Bay, he arrived in Carrick on a Sunday, and there was a big uh, meeting, and it was organised by a local from this parish again. He was a Father Cassidy. And then they came up to one Kelly Beggs, and they had a big day up in Crow, that's in the hills above Kelly Beggs and Duncan Hill. And uh, Pierce described it as a Gaelic oasis in a planted area, which it was. It was still Irish-speaking at that time. And then they came on up. They had a meeting with the teachers and that in this area and the priests and uh, finished up in Donegal Town. And for the days that Pierce was in the area, he stayed in McManus's house. Mm-hmm. And can I just ask... Um Helen, the, the college that he set up, is this uh, Kalosh Olu in, in Clohanili? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, there's a lot written about that, but kind of so far from here, like apart from Pierce visit, and it, you know. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, then um, Patrick Pierce then was interested in opening a, a school in Dublin, and Seamus was one of the people who put money into it, he put money into it a couple of times. And... Um, his, his name was uh, on the uh, board of directors, and Seamus also put money into a thing called Clo Coolan. That was a printing company that was printing sort of the Gaelic type of things that was badly wanted. Um, by this time, then, we came on, <clears throat> next thing we came to, say, 1910, and then that election when uh, the um, part, when um, the Home Rule Party held the balance of power and in for uh, I can ask with, uh, they were promised the second Home Rule Bill. And um, but as the prospect of Home Rule became uh, nearer, uh, support for a lot of Gaelic activity sort of fell off. Now by that as well, Seamus had, had begun going back to America periodically further in his literary career, doing tours, uh, lecture tours, etc., and he was spending less and less time in uh, Ireland. And uh, they, as this all went on, the kind of the bit of the momentum of the Gaelic revival in this area and around the Donegal Bay area, it kind of you know tapered off. Uh, people still went to Cayleys and went to cultural events, and that especially young people. But uh, the most of the people believed that. The Home Rule was the only way they were going to get any kind of self-determination. And um, that that was all over because Arthur Griffith had to write to uh, Patrick McManus in Argentina looking for money to keep his paper going because with the prospect of Home Rule now, uh, any other just was only sort of fringe politics. And can you just tell me about Seamus's brother, in Argentina. His name was Patrick, is that right? His name was Patrick. He he was older than Seamus. He was national school in Mount Charles. He got as far as being appointed a teacher under the board, but he wouldn't he, he wouldn't work under an English board and he emigrated to America. And he joined the American Navy and he spent quite a bit of time there were down in the, the South American waters down there. And when he left the Navy, he uh, he settled in Argentina. He became a governor or a tutor for a very wealthy family. And he amassed money and he bought a huge estate in the Argentina. 
he was a leading light in all kind of Gaelic activities. He founded the Gaelic League there, or he was one of the founders. He founded a paper called Fianna. Uh, it was um, again Irish interest, and but there were articles in it in Spanish, and English, and in Irish. So his, and, uh, his I suppose his. Um his life in Argentina, it's not the traditional way, I suppose, Irish people ended up in Argentina. Oh, not at all. Right. And he, um, he bought property then in Ireland, bought a couple of places when things were being sold off in the landed estates courts and that. He bought a couple of small estates and how, big houses around the area here. And he gave much employment. But they said he was very, you know, very autocratic sort of in his way as well. You know, people would talk about that. But... Um, he was a, he again was a huge supporter of Irish causes. For example, he um, financed the publication or, or the translation of Mitchell's Jail Journal. And uh, he, he so he was he was uh, as I say quite prominent in the Argentina and the move. So then um, nineteen ten. Anyway, I was talking about the Home Rule. And uh, the the battle coming in, and uh, now when it was failed in the Lords, it was a change from the last time because they couldn't. Um, the bill now could only be delayed for two years, and uh, this that was then when kind of the uh, Protestant uh, opposition then arose to the granting of Home Rule, and uh, that was the t- uh, then the first of that was the. Uh, Covenant, and uh, the covenant was say, signed here, and uh, there was uh, two places here uh, for signing it in this parish, and practically all the non-Catholics did sign it. The men signed the covenant, the women the declaration, and uh, the, the biggest signing of all in the whole of County Donegal was in Donegal Town. There was, uh, there was great opposition to the uh, Home Rule in the, this area. Then, um, of course, it was a great kind of piece of theatre, all right, the Covenant, but it didn't really alter anything politically. And the following year, 1913, Ulster Volunteers were founded. And those Ulster Volunteers were found in Durham, and they trained in the or- down at the Orange Hall, and it said they can train, train loads of guns, and that was the local story. Uh, of course, then the Catholics see in the volunteer, the Ulster volunteers, then they found their own volunteers, and groups of them were set up in this parish as well. Uh, just then, when the bill was due to become law, I'm not going into the whole of the national history, uh, that war, 1914, broke out, mm-hmm. and on the recommendation of Redmond, uh, some of the local volunteers did join uh, the army. Uh, there was, some of them didn't, but the movement kind of fell away, and there wasn't much activity in, locally in those years. And uh, they are be sent to representative for two rounds, trying to, you know, jizz the things up or get on the road again, sort of. But they met very little uh, help, like they reported that they visited the McManus home. Seamus, of course, couldn't come back because... On their door, as a the defence of the Realm Act, he couldn't. Um, and it was a, if you were against the, the government or anything, yeah, that it was a, 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 an offence. So Seamus couldn't come back. But uh, these people stayed in McManus's home, and uh, they were told now that it wouldn't be possible now to get sort of anything going then. The 1916 uh, rebellion took the people here completely by surprise. They didn't know what it was. Some people thought it was part of the, the Great War. Mm. And people thought that um, it was jeopardising their chances of getting home rule. But just like the rest of the nation, when the leaders were eventually released, uh, there was kind of a new mood abroad in the land. And volunteers and common the man were set up, were reorganised in this area. Um, the common the man hadn't been organised in this area before 1916, as far as is known. Of course, it was founded in 1914 because the women wanted to have part in the national movement. But uh, an organiser came from um, Limerick 
and uh, helped to get it going. And uh, there was three or four branches of it in this parish here. And then there was the volunteers as well. I'm sorry, Helen, could I could I just ask you just bef- just before um, we, we talk about the, the volunteers and coming them on, in that area, in advance of, I suppose, the change in mood after the um, after the 1916 rising, up until that point, the people who had been involved in the Gaelic League in the area, would they have fallen in behind uh, the Irish Parliamentary Party and supported Home Rule, or like would would it have been the same people who would have been involved in in the Gaelic League as were involved in those political organisations as well? Well, uh, the, the basic people that would have been the Home Rule people, they would have still still been in charge of the you know the local. AOH and the local things. Yes. Some probably would have changed allegiance, you know, maybe and vaguely supported them without doing very much about it. Do you know that kind yes, of a way? Yes, 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 yes. Aye, and yes. Uh, no, I was just, I was just curious, kind of, to, just to see where the, the, are, are we talk, Is it the same groups of people, I suppose, that are you know moving between these know, organizations? The original and people that were back in the. Um, that were the original people back in the AOH and that they would still have, you know, been in charge of their organisation. But other people would have sort of, you know, you know, kind of gravitated that way without doing very much about it, I would say, because there was no election till 1918. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, one of the first things the volunteers did was... Um, they took a boat. The Marquis Cunningham had a boat on... Uh, what was uh, Glen Law profession. And they carried the boat across the hill to another lake, what we call St. Peter's Lake. And they rowed out on it, and there was a small island out on the uh, on the law called Power Island, and they raised the tricolour there. Now, various accounts tell us that that was the first time that the tricolour was seen in the area. But uh, I've come across now a writing that tells that earlier, about 1914, there was a fish in Teelan. And local people went to go down to Teelan beside Carrick. They went on the train to Killy Beggs and go then from Killy Beggs round to Teelan. They went round on a boat. And that the, the Union Jack was on the boat. It was a government. It was a, I don't just know, know, was it a private boat or not, but... Uh, they would have had, you know, been passengers on her for the day, and the flag was on the boat, and that uh, the uh, were the people aboard, uh, a couple of them were being extreme uh, nationalists, and they pulled the unionist flag down and raised the tricolour. And a writer wrote later wrote that he was on the boat that day, and that's the first time that the tricolour was raised in the area. And around what year would that have been, um, Helen? Pardon? Around what year would that have been? That it would have been before 1916. Before 1916. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. It was sort of a pattern at a house that the boys joined the volunteers. The girls often joined the um, Come and the Man. Uh, and do you know the name of that woman who came up was from too. That, uh, yeah. She, Miss Castle uh, see us and there was a, an O'Callaghan lady up as, came up as well. They were up at different times. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. They were county wide, you know. I don't hope to spend a lot of time in this area or not. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Now, the interesting thing about it was that all the uh, new Sinn Féin clubs now, they were called, they were set up. And then, of course, most of the people were in the Sinn Féin, were in the volunteers. You know, there was a... <laughs> some people were in everything and yes. <laughs> some people just wasn't anything and everything, you know. Yes. But uh, they all had patriotic names like the Patrick Sarsfields and Mount Charles. You had the Sean McDermott's and Frosts and that, and all over the whole of the county. But the only name of a common the man that has come down to us that I've been able to find is the one in Donegal Town, and it was called the Inyindu. And Inyindu, of course, was the mother of Red Hugh O'Donnell. Oh. Oh. Mm. And and would you say that in the area that the I suppose the strength of the Gaelic League in that area um, led to the strength of the was influential in the strength of the volunteers and coming on 
and Sinn Féin in the area subsequently. That the distinction that was footing. the parish was a bit divided. Okay. Uh, the mountain area, especially, uh, they stuck to the um, AOH, and uh, but the, most of the rest of the parish here down towards the shore, that was all Sinn Féin. You know, there were exceptions, but uh, taking it as a whole. And, of course, the first time then that, um, the first uh, meeting that was in Frost's then to uh, organize uh, oh, the conscription, that was the first kind of a test or the first big, um, when it was announced then that there was that uh, conscription was to come in. And all the groups then sort of united against it, the AOH, the Sinn Féin, the clergy, everybody. But Sinn Féin got most of the credit because there were a new, bright, young, outgoing group, uh, you know, publicity, good at that. So they got all the credit for organising against the, uh, the conscription. And the women organised, the come and the man organised a thing they call La and the Man. That was the Women's Day. And it was around the Feast of Column Kelt, which was on the 9th of June. And they, they must have been thinking back to the signing of the covenant. Uh, they got petitions signed against a conscription. They were signed at the churches. And they had a big rally too in uh, Donegal Town as well. Yes, yes. And of course, anything like that was in Donegal Town. Uh, you know, the branches from this area here would, you know, support it. And then the next, I suppose, big uh, event for them all was the 1918 election. Yes. And um, the um, locally, of course, there was a PG Ward was the national the Sinn Féin candidate, and uh, yeah, O'Donovan he was the um, candidate for the uh, national the old Home Rule Party, and uh, there was a lot of the. Uh, but when both the first election, the people, you know, would got very interested in. And, of course, now women over 30 had the vote and the, you had you know, franchise extended. And uh, an interesting thing at that time, too, was that um, now in this parish there'll be several polling booths. At that time, the nearest polling booth was in Donegal Town. And people from this area had to go to Donegal Town to vote. And it was the month of December... And uh, it had an advantage, of course, that uh, police and those in Donegal Town watching the comings and goings, they wouldn't know the people in out the rural areas like this. And, of course, there was widespread impersonation. And uh, this uh, sergeant, it was said, in charge in Donegal Town, uh, remarked when somebody went out after voting, he said, well, that raincoat was out and in here quite a few times today already. My goodness. Uh, they had, <coughs> that would be all been organised by Sinn Féin, like they had, a, an, a, you know, people going in, especially elderly people that wouldn't be going to vote or what, but then nobody would know. People that were away would probably be on the register as well. And uh, so there was widespread. Imp- but anyhow, of course, the uh, Sinn Féin swept the boards and my father used to tell another story about the election. It was the year 1918, when you think of it now, was the time of the big flu. And uh, there was a woman in the town land, one of these that was supposed never to be strong, as they used to say. And uh, But she insisted on going, going to Donegal Town to vote. Now, from there to Donegal Town was seven miles. On a, and the only transport they had was a donkey and cart. And she went to Donegal Town to vote on the donkey and said, husband went up out to Donegal Town and back on a donkey cart in the month of December. And my father used to always end up the story by saying she had all the coats in the town land on her. <laughs> Everybody was giving her clothes to keep her warm. But it showed the spirit of the people, I always think. And it's and it's hard to tell the turnout of that particular election, isn't it, because of the impersonation and, and that sort uh, of thing? Well, I don't think it made that much difference, yeah. really. Yeah. No, not really. I mean, the victory was huge. It wasn't like the election today. Mm, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the counting of the of the uh, US yeah, elections no. are happening today, yes. Yeah. So, um, there was huge celebrations, bonfires and all that in the place, you know, when the election was over.
And you mentioned there uh, the Spanish flu, Helen. And just while you, put, uh, you mentioned there the, the Spanish flu um, epidemic of 1918, and just while, while, while we're on it, um, would you know whether or not that area was uh, badly affected by it? The strange thing is I never heard an awful lot of talk about it. Uh, I do know, you know, there was a family that lived, uh, people that lived quite close to us, and I know their parents died of the Spanish flu. I know their parents died, and I know, uh, knew an, uh, I was friendly with another girl, and uh, two of her aunts died. But I don't think it could have been that bad. Yeah. It would be, I think, you see, there was just so much else going on at the time. Mm. That the time was remembered for the political you know, more than for this, uh, for, for that now. I think that would be the reason. Yes, yes. So Sinn Féin swept the boards then in, in, in the 1918 election. And who was elected locally there, Helen? He was PJ Ward. He was a young yes. solicitor. Yes. The actual uh, War of Independence, of course, in the area, as I said, I think I said before, wasn't as intense or fought to the degree it would have been in some areas in the south. Uh, and I would think until the coming of the Black and Tans, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, activity. Um, the people, of course, were, t- were very afraid of the Tans coming into the houses and shooting as they went along the road and uh, that type of thing. And um, the usual uh, trying to interrupt the uh, commercial life of the area went on too. The creamery was born as a creamery manager, Patrick Barry, he was very impo- involved in the movement. He was actually a cork man. Uh, he was up, um, got the job of creamery manager, so that's what had him up in Donegal. And uh, he was um, on a board that was, he was in the district council and all that type of thing. And uh, he was on the run quite a bit. Uh, the towns, of course, I think I mentioned before that they went uh, People couldn't stay at home, people that were prominent in the movement, and they moved about to safe houses. And <clears throat> that's where the, um, the phrase, the flying column, came from. And uh, then, of course, you had other commercial things that were, you know, attacked as well. And the post offices, they were attacked, and the people had to go to Donegal Town to collect their pension, which wasn't easy if you're over 70 to get from here to Donegal Town. And uh, the railway at times was various incidents when the rail, the train, uh, the manager, of course, he was very pro-establishment and uh, he was ordered then not to uh, transport the tans. And when he did then, they, they uh, did something to put the railway out of commission and, you know, that type of thing that went on all over Ireland. The biggest event in the area happened on the 22nd of February in 1921. Already the barrack, because of the attacks on barracks, uh, the smaller rural barracks were closed and the the forces all went into the big barrack in Donegal Town. And uh, the fair day in Charles was the 22nd of February and uh, in the morning the police, four, I think, police were coming out from Donegal Town to police the fair. And they were coming out uh, uh, cycling. And when they came to what we call the Glen in Charles, just on the Donegal Town side of the town, uh, they were ambushed there and one of them was shot. And, uh, of course, the assailants, they disappeared quickly into the country and the background, but of course, when the word came out from Donegal Town, the house businesses were all ordered to close. They were ordered to close in Donegal Town, and uh, the people knew that there would be re- repercussions. And the fair people quickly left the fair, and people in the town that had anyone in the country, they moved out. My father used to tell that we had relations in the town that business there. They came out to our house, and. Uh, that night, the uh, town then was attacked by the. Well, there was, you know, there was a lot of dispute about who they were. Were they all the black and tans? Were some of them the police from Donegal Town disguised? You know, those kind of debates about that. Uh, but they ransacked and burned a couple of the um, uh, Sinn Fein houses, as they were called. And then they went to the house of the McManus and. Uh, 
when they were there, there was a Joe McManus in the movement and who brother Seamus is the one that kind of stood on at home. And the police thought it was him they saw kind of in the dim light at the top of the stairs and the shot, but it wasn't him at all. It was one of their own men in the confusion. And uh, so they then uh, quickly uh, sort of got him to come down, they had the what, cross or whatever you call the tenders they had, and he sort of went back to Donegal Town, which meant that the rest of the town wasn't attacked. Uh, of course, when this started, people tried to get out of houses and uh, some getting out back windows and that type of thing, back doors. And, uh, next morning, it was discovered that uh, from one of the McManus houses, a girl was shot. She had got out the back and was shot at the in the backyard. Uh, she was in her twenties, and it was said that she had she was embroidered in a tablecloth for the church in Mount Charles, and uh, she had it. What seemingly she took it with her, so what she had it with her when her body was discovered. Oh, then at that time there was no graveyard in Mount Charles, so her funeral was in process. So it was anticipated that that would be a day that there would be some trouble again. And uh, the uh, funeral uh, came out from Mount Charles, and uh, when they were all gathered, and people were gathered, and it was a big funeral, um, the people heard, they would know the tans coming, they would know the sound of the cross or or whatever you call the tenders, and uh, they uh, coming in from the direction of Donegal Town. So they, those prominent in the movement uh, realised they would better get out of the way, and they ran down the street to head, hoping to get off, uh, move off a side road. But the, when they met, towns came up the other way as well, and uh, the, these men, they went up to the back lane, and they actually had in the manure heap up at Cares as a house up that lane. But uh, the paper men were all lined up, and a good few of the men were arrested that day. Now, up here on the hill overlooking the village, uh, people kind of gathered to watch the funeral. Women didn't go to funerals much that time, and there was a crowd of them gathered to watch the nude weekend, to see what big crowd coming out from a charlotte and something to look at. And they were up on the ridge, and went to spied by some of the military, uh, or some of the men, and they uh, had come. And they came up, they cut across the field, fields and came up. And, of course, when the people realized on the ditch saw them coming, they melted away as quickly as they could, except one man. That was the, owner, the son of the owner here of the house, um, Uncle Charlie. And he stayed on. He was repairing the ditch, and he kept on doing it. And uh, when they came up to him, they searched him, and uh, they made him stand up on the, uh, on the ditch, and with his arms in the air, surrender, you know, uh, and told them that if he did, they were to, he was to stay like that till they got back to Frost's and that they'd shoot him if he didn't. So I would say he stayed and did what he was told. And this is your husband's uncle, Charlie? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Helen, do you know the name of the girl who was killed and whose funeral? I was Mary Harley. Mary Harley. 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 Okay. Yeah, and actually her father was a superintendent in the RIS or the Metropolitan Police in London. You know, talking about Catholics joining the forces, he had joined and gone from there. And so the the how did the day end of the funeral? Did they did they leave? Well, there was a lot and then was a lot of the volunteers were uh, t- taken in. Some of them went to some of them ended up in the Corra and some of them in Valley Kindler and Ebrington Barracks in Derry and you know different ones to the Fenner, You know, <laughs> different ones were taken to different places and some were let out again and some weren't. And you get a lot of going over to follow the career, career of each one of them. But it was a day that was always spoken about. It was kind of a highlight, you know. Yeah. And would it have... Um, I'm just I'm just imagining, as you describe it, like the fear people had of, you oh, know, then, yeah. having I remember, to flee you know, the was, town. Uh, a lot of stories like that about, you know, people... Uh, you know, if they're out on the road and see the hear the coming, because you see there would be no other mechanized traffic about, so they would hear the tenders coming and people uh, going into houses and hiding behind ditches, that type of story. Ah, uh, that's okay. Um, 
That would be about, I would say, the uh, the main events on the area, you know, uh, at the, uh, d- during the time, as I said, it wasn't a, a, an area of huge strategic importance or anything like. Uh, then, of course, uh, when the Civil War came along, you had the usual split, sometimes among families. The place I live in here is called Coolum, and... Uh, it's comparatively speaking with the other places in the area, it was always sort of a fair sized farm. Uh, John's grandfather, he was also John Meehan. Uh, he was on the Board of Guardians, the District Council, the Clown Committee, the AOH. Uh, he was kind of, you know, prominent man in the area. And uh, he, the family at that time, when it was only show in town, the AOH, he, that would be in their politics. But then when the volunteers were found at the family, my husband's father, who though was quite young, and the older brothers, they were coming along and they joined the volunteers. And their cousins, the Monaghans up here, joined uh, the Monaghan grand, uh, old Johnny's sister, uh, Mary, she was married to Monaghan. So they were first cousins. So the, both those uh, families were in the volunteers. The Monaghans were very prominent. And uh, as I said, this uh, is a bit off the beaten track, and um, it was called kind of a safe house. There was a double barn loft at it, which was a bit unusual at the time. So they had a place there where the uh, men could uh, sleep, could uh, could hide out, and you know, without interrupting the family too much. And uh, the boys, as I said, were on the volunteers, and the girls were in the um, come in the man. The problem was, well, as far as I was concerned, it was very hard to get them to talk very much about the common the man or what they did or what they didn't do. You know, there would sort of be an odd reference. They would have to carry messages here or there or about going somewhere and maybe uh, met up with somebody or, you know, something like that. But uh, as I say, it was just hard to get, uh, you know, people were kind of still reluctant to talk very much about what went on. And, these, and would have been, um, these would have been John, your husband John's aunts and uncles. Yeah, the, yes. yeah, uh, yeah. And um, the, I remember, like, I've, from I came here every um, summer, I would have the mall out here for a day. Uh, there were several of them lived in Mount Charles. They had businesses there, or were married to business people, or whatever. And uh, I took them all out here. It was nice. We'd have a nice day, you know, and. Uh, my husband used to like it because he said it was very handy. They'd all chat to each other. <laughs> and if they came individually, he would have to do more talking. <laughs> I'd him down to the ground. But I remember, you know, I'd ask them, but try to get, you know, chat around to come on the man. And the only answer I could get from one of them was, should we got our man out of it? And it turned out that one of them, the older one, she married a man that he was here on the run. He was quite prominent in the uh, movement. He was Donahue McNeilis. There's a monument to him down in Glen Colin Kell. And she got married to him. And Aunt Cassie got married to a Welshman. Uh, he was he was a nationalist in business in Belfast. And uh, they were burned out. And he knew people in the village, the McCollians, we called them. That would be the Coughlin, the ancestors of the Coughlin political dynasty, and uh, Aunt Cassie and them, they were cousins, and uh, Aunt Cassie was down, out and in there, and she met Joe, and uh, that's where she married. So that was two of them. Then Aunt Annie, she would tell me later in life, she would tell me that she had a boyfriend in the movement, but that he took the uh, treaty side. And because the men in the house was going on and the rose ch- giving out and going on, uh, she just broke off with him. And uh, she, that ended that romance. And uh, much later in life, she got married to somebody else. She had no, she was elderly, she had no family. But she just would say, if things had worked out and she'd have got married, she would have, you know, probably would have. So there was them yes. that did well out of it and there was them that, you know, the yeah. human side... Yes, yes. Uh, God, that's and um, Monaghan, I mentioned then uh, Monaghan's, the, that family, uh, they, of course, were very prominent in the, in the anti-treaty side, just the people here were, but Monaghan's house was burned. 
And the account in the paper said that nobody knew who burned it. And somebody wrote it in a book afterwards and I said if it would take go and do some inquiring instead of writing what was in the paper. Because the dogs in the street knew who burned Monaghan's. It was the three forces or locals. They all were together in the movement a short time before. And uh, they came in the middle of the night to burn it and um, they wouldn't let them take anything with them. The only thing they managed to get taken was a, a photo of a uh, grand-uncle, a priest, Father Glacken. We all have a photo of Father Glacken. Uh, but they got taken that and they had to get out of the house and the house was burned. And then they used to tell the story, Mithal used to tell about a woman lived near us. She was a wee bit simple. And the talk was going on about uh, Monaghan's being burned. It was a big topic. And she said, oh, God, she says, uh, they must have got an awful shock when they got up in the morning and the house burned around them. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> you to tell things like that about things that had happened. But uh, then the, uh, the Monaghan's had the quarries, the John Keelan and Mount Charles stone quarries, and there were mine, quarry mines there. And they set up some kind of a living there, and uh, they used to cook the dinner and all for them down here, and the food was taken up to them till they got somewhere fixed up and eventually, of course, compensation and they got a house built, but that was some time afterwards. So that would have been kind of the big event during the uh, the uh, Civil War and Bonnie Glen House, which belonged to what was then the Sinclair Estate, it was burned and it was burned in rep, uh, kind of because of the Drumbo markers that in, kind of in retaliation for the shooting of the Jumbo markers. It didn't kind of make a lot of sense, but that was what was done. And the, the caretaker and those who were allowed to get out, the uh, sinker himself was abroad. And um, that was kind of another one of the houses that were burned at the time. And around that area, um, Helen, would you say that there was the majority of people would have been anti-treaty or it, it didn't really split geographically. It was just, you know... Half. I would say that it would be about half and half, I would think. OK, yeah. Yeah, just it, I would think, you know. Uh, they always say, of course, after the aftermath, the uh, coping method of the people was completely different from the coping method of people today. You know, day to day talk about your problems and put it up on Facebook and that a dog, American way of, you know, talking about everything and analysing it. The people had the direct opposite approach. Nobody said anything. It was it was passed, uh, except of course pubs and fair evenings. Uh, there would be political debates and pro other times in pubs as well. There would be political debates, but. On the ground, sort of, the people just got on with their life. Uh, hay had to be put in, men had to be gathered up for that, men getting turf home, up and down to the bog. All that had to still go on, and just the people got on with it and tried to speak nothing more about it. And would you uh, say a lot of the in the in the direct aftermath that it, it um, so was, was the was the split, I suppose, very obvious. In the direct aftermath, would there have been, I suppose, anti-treaty families would have helped each other out or pro-treaty families would have helped not each other so out? Not so much. Or? I think, yeah. well, there might be a wee bit of it, but not an awful lot. The people just kind of went on. You got your neighbours to put in the help, you to put in the hay and you put in theirs. And, you know, uh, it, uh, just the people, that's the way they cope. They just sort of try to imagine it never happened. And uh, eventually people, you know, from the two sides would have got married. And, you know, as I say, there was some aunts who surely broke up. My aunt's case now was John's aunt's aunt Danny was a case in point of that, like, you know. But um, the people just, as I say, you know, there was a lot of emigration, though, after it. I suppose I always say the saddest lesson that people had to learn was that political freedom wasn't this, wasn't economic freedom or economic independence, yes. and uh, the, the a lot of the anti-treaty force um, men on the fought on the anti-treaty side went to America. Now two of John's uncles here went. Now some some of those that went then 
uh, the time of the oppression in America, some of them came back. Mm. Uh, others of them never came back. And there would have been an awful lot of emigration in general anyway from that Well, there area. would have been, you see that, but there would have been yeah. a lot of emigration yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And would, would, would John's aunts and uncles, was, you were saying the aunts really, you know, it was very difficult to get any stories out of them about their time in coming to man. Yeah. Um, would the men have been any more vocal about the War of Independence? Well, they would. They would talk now. Uh, John's father and another uncle. They were both in the Curra. They were. They were left at the time of the Civil War, and they were for some years in the Curra. In fact, John's father was quite young, and uh, the diet and that there, he kind of it was somebody always had a you know weak stomach because they say he couldn't eat this and that to you know, and they always blamed it for the time he was in the Curra. And Aunt Mary used to tell about when they were there, uh, they used to send them parcels of food and that. And she would tell about her getting out to the town to post the parcels. And would he have talked much about the about his experiences in the Curra or Not a lot. They no. wouldn't to me. I would now have difficulty getting them. And later times John's father used to tell him a good bit about it. They two were very close, like. And John's father would tell him a lot about it, but uh uh, otherwise, you know, they wouldn't they just the uh, ones that knew other in the time of the trouble. Then would you know meet up later on. They might talk there, mm-hmm. see other affairs. Or I remember one time my husband's father was in hospital, and the man in the bed next to him knew him because they both knew other the time of the trouble. And as that generation, I suppose. Um it got older and when it was election time then throughout the years would, well, what was that, that like? Oh that would now flare up a bit, uh, there would be more uh, it would be the same with the 12th of July and the Protestants day I mean as I was saying about the communities getting on well uh, there will be always to say a certain kind of a coolness and you know, we keep a wee bit out of the way around the 12th of July on the other hand, there were people then who would always on that day look after the cattle or the stock, some cattle for their neighbour, and there'll be the uh, 15th of August was the big AOH day, and uh, some Protestant man would look after the cattle for, you know, the neighbour that day, you know. Yeah, yeah, so they still managed to coexist and to... Uh, oh, that, that, yeah. that, was, that would be the thing that was co- that did coexist. Uh, yeah. And and as these, I suppose, um, your your husband's family then sort of, you know, anti-treaty, um, quite Republican involvement in the volunteers and coming to Man. And you were saying that, I suppose, by that your your family had quite a different tradition. Yeah, well, my father role should be a phenophile supporter, but he, he never was very active at, uh, and, and, you know, Meetings or anything, he'd vote on that, but he, uh, he'd be well read and would follow up all this, but he, he wouldn't, uh, you know, just as I say, they wouldn't have been as active or, as, you know, on the political scene to the same extent. And then, as I said, my mother's family, they were Van Gale supporters all the time. Uncle Wally used to do impersonation, you know, do, for the Fianna Fáil over, or for Van Gale or at election in his area, like, you know. So they were, your parents were a, a sort of a mixed marriage of Fianna Fáil no, yeah, and Fianna Gale. Well, yeah, as far as politics were concerned, yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. And and what, what sort of things might you have heard? I know we spoke a little bit about them already, about um, your family history and their, their um their memories of that period of the the War of Independence and of the Civil War. Well, you see, um, my father, my father, uh, and uh, he had only one sister, and she went to she was going to America, and uh, so apart from just my father talking, you know, in general about the wouldn't have uh, he would talk there about things that happened, you know, about uh, the woman going out to the vote and all the coats in the town land on her and. Uh, that type of thing. Uh, I think, you know, people sort of just, um, you know, they just kind of, there was so much else to be worrying about. Yes, 
Yes. Mm-hmm. I remember the time. I remember it was school at the time that uh, the clan, the public, just started, and uh, there was a local candidate, a Finn Gale candidate, up, and uh, Finn Fall candidate was Joe Brennan. He was um, he's been connected to my husband's people here, and um, Pa O'Donnell. He was from down from Dunlow, and. Uh, then was Fancy Cannon from Mount Charles. He was represent. He was up for Clan the Public. And uh, by now, you see, uh, whereas most of the um, anti-treaty people had John Fianna Fáil, by that, some people were kind of just getting a wee bit tired. They weren't making a lot of progress. The country wasn't doing very well economically or any other way. And uh, the Clan the Public appeared on the scene with a new, fresh image. And... Uh, seem to be going places and uh, some of the um, Fianna Fáil lot then went over to Clan the Public and uh, at school then we used to if I was a bit well we in the master's room as we used to say which means you'll be I'd be 10 or 11 at the time and uh, well we, we used to have great time arguing and debating about politics and I remember coming home from school all our side Barry Brillahan was Fianna Fáil and the ones going down the other roads, uh, well, they weren't Fianna Fáil anyway, I can't remember. But remember, we'd be calling up a devil area, we was calling going up the road, we'd be calling up Deva, and they'd be going down the other way, and they'd be saying, he's a communist, he's a Jew, he's a Jew, he's a communist. And the ones saying it died, they knew what a Jew or a communist was. My goodness. <laughs> yeah, but it was kind of, remember that, the election, you know, at school. The master now that we had at school, Master McGrothy, who taught me, and he was actually there the first year I was back. He was quite prominent in the movement in his young days, but he kind of had uh, moved out of, uh, he wasn't, you know, actively, I think we didn't realise that he had, you know, uh, kind of as much at all. Teacher, Mrs. Barry, uh, she was married, uh, Patrick Barry, I mentioned, uh, she'd been in Common the Man and that, but we didn't know that. There was a kind of a, you know, kind of a culture of just, except now they're like my father who would be interested in reading and talking and that. But there were houses that wasn't a bit worried about politics in them. Or at least as far as the children were concerned, do you know? Yes. And when you were in school in, in the 40s, um, Helen, you, you went to school in Frosses. Yeah. Um, and is, can you remember, I suppose, the... Um, how history was taught. Was there a national well, ethos to things? Well, all up to me, all my days, history was taught. Um, it has, well, I think um, history was taught to um, instill patriotism. And But then, of course, every other country was doing the same. <laughs> we weren't alone, and do, uh, you know. But um, history wasn't, it was just, taught out of the book. Now, for example, we related about the plantation of Ulster, but there'd be no mention that the people in the, the Protestants in Durham would have, you know, come in at the plantation of Ulster. It wasn't kind of localised. It was just the book and the book was taught, and, you know. And, of course, uh, very much uh, uh, taught to, to teach patriotism. And it was the same in um, when secondary school, and it was the same in Kerry Sport and the uh, uh, there, I mean, you, you wouldn't be advancing any different ideas of your own if you wanted to get on. You know, I was quite, I was not boasting, but it, I was, would have been good at history at school. I never found history hard to learn. I always kind of string it along or something. But I uh, remember that, like it was, you were taught, to, you were taught history, but you weren't taught to research. Yes, yeah. And there wouldn't have been, I'm guessing, from what you're saying, there wasn't, unless, maybe I'm completely wrong, but unless it was around the time of elections or something like that, that politics didn't really enter enter into like classroom discussion or anything like that. Ah, no, it it wouldn't be in college. That that was one of the the few disadvantages I would have when we were at college, that we weren't allowed papers. And I think that, <clears throat> I suppose it was, I don't know, it was, it was a great emphasis on being, we had to speak all Irish and that, like you see and that. But uh, I think, you know, to keep us abreast of current affairs would have been a, 
you know, would, would have been for like nurses and that often think would have been useful. And was this in Kerry's first or was it as far as back as Fulcara? In Fulcara. In Fulcara. And you just wanted to wear papers around if you could buy it, afford to buy it every day, but you didn't for you were too much. You know, you would, there was papers, there was a good library there and that. And in, in Fulcara, it was a preparatory school that you went to. Um, right, yeah. Yes, and it was run by the Loretto's. Ron, I would have to say that Loretto run, nuns ran it practically the way they ran all their schools. Yes. Yeah. They had, you know, they had coal, they had music, they had drama, we had debate, you know, all that type of thing. But it was all, everything was in Irish. Yes. And was that, was there, would there have been a nationalist ethos there, um, would you say, Helen, or was that just, uh, I suppose, because it was a teacher training college, there was an emphasis on Irish? Oh, there would have been, oh, there's great emphasis on Irish, like, yeah, and Irish history, whatever way it was on the book. And uh, Kerry's Fort, there would be quite a, an emphasis on Irish, but because it was so big and so many people, it was, um, it was harder to, you know, I suppose, for them to monitor exactly what everybody was doing in that line. But I do remember one story. De Valera had taught in Kerry's Fort before uh, 1916, and uh, he was always invited in for the big formal concert at the end of the year. And uh, the concert would be before the fi- senior final would start, so to be say, sometime in May. And uh, there was a program, an all printer program for the concert and all. De Valera and the wife were in and all at it. And uh, the following day, he, De Valera came back in to visit the nuns. He used to come seemingly now and again. And we were up on the study, and uh, the word came up that uh, if we'd send our programs down, the De Valera would sign them. Now, I had written my name in English on my program, because I always thought my name looked better in English than in Irish, because the Irish form that was used for my name, Mac Umara, was the same as Ridge. And the Ridge girls, whom I got quite friendly with, and Kerry Sport as well. They were from Connemara. And uh, so I had my name written, Helen Montgomery, on my program in English. So the programs all went down, and eventually they came back. But my, I was told that mine wasn't signed. They couldn't let David Ayer see a name like that. No. <laughs> oh my! God. So they wouldn't even present it to him. <laughs> so funny because my father was such a supporter. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, but oh, that's just now, that was the kind of thing used to go on, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And when when you were being prepared to be teachers in in Kerry's first, um, was there I suppose that the history curriculum that you were going to go on and teach didn't cover the period of, you know, the War of Independence or nineteen sixty. It was on the pe- thing, but you know this we, <laughs> people never seem to get that far, put it that way. And they did finish it nineteen twenty one. It didn't go into the Civil War. Yeah. Yeah. And when you were in Carysford and also Fulcara, there were people from all over the country there. Well, Carysford was from all over, yeah. yeah. Yes. And um, Fulcara, there were people there from those girls from Cork and Kilkenny, Dublin, quite a few, Monaghan, you know. Mm-hmm. But the bulk of them now would be from Donegal, like. Yes. Because half of the places was allocated to people who had got what was called a star in Irish. Okay. And like I wouldn't have been one of that lot, I mean, now in English speaking. Yes, yes. And so what years were you in Kerry's first then, um, Helen? 55 to 57. Okay. See, and we, we, like now, teach your trainings longer. I was doing the senior final on my 20th birthday. And yeah. your, senior fi- your senior final is your final exam for yeah, that to qualify? Yeah, that's the final exam, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose 1950s Dublin, um, you know, the state is only, you know, 30 years old odd. Um, what was life like there for, I suppose, a young woman from Donegal? And um, Look, we loved, well, I taught then there for three years. Yes. And, uh, well, I thought it was, it was grand. You see, there's plenty of young people around in the country areas at home that wouldn't be. You know, so we had, uh, we used to go to the... Um, the rail, the Irish section of the Legion of Mary, the, some of my friends, they would have been Irish speakers. 
And there was all sorts of things to go through. And would there still have been, I suppose, the kind of the, the Gaelic League, Cayleys and, and those sorts of things, were they happening around that time? Well, oh, they were there. I would mean that some of them, I didn't go to all of them. Now, there were some like far more on Irish things than I was. And then at the same time, I wasn't against Irish things. It would be at some of the things, you know, that kind of a way. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and you were teaching in, you were saying, in the Loretto College in North Great George's Street. And North Great George's Street, that was the national school section, it was called the Hill Street School. Oh, Hill Street, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, and what was that like? Well, uh, at, the children now, it was a deprived area, like the national school, like we were, there was a secondary school over across the wall, like they had, uh, and uh, I think they had a junior school there too. Um Ah, the classes were huge. Like, I remember I was 56 in fifth class the time I got my diploma. But then nobody would have any pity for you. There were people, the new school starting up out in Valley Fairmont and places sort of people had over 60 in their class. But I, the thing I would say, I mean, I think of people, young people now, and I think of young people then. And we have this idea now that so people imagine we were kind of repressed or that we had no freedom and we had an awful time comparing the wonderful world that's in it now. But I don't see it that way at all. Uh, you know, I just think one day out there, and I was in Dublin there back, and I went out, was coming, I went out to see actually the new Divine Mercy Church way out. And I was coming back in on the bus, and um, there was just one lady who was sitting across from me. And we came to the next stop, and the crowd of young people that got into the bus, all with prams and children with them, young children, young women, the woman, the other woman sat over beside me. And the bus went on down to, half of them couldn't get into it. The bus came down to, I can't remember, was it Talek or Clondalkin? And uh, they all got out. And she, down to the health centre to be seen. And the woman told me that they were those young ones, who, I would say there was none of them over 20. They were all living with their boyfriends at home, in their own home, children. And I said, what kind of a youth are they? When we were in Dublin, we had all these things to go to, and we had went to dances, and most people met up somebody and got married eventually. And, you know, that we had a great youth. We didn't feel any repressed. You were told to watch yourself, and you did, as they used to say. You know, and I can't see why all this idea now has been got across all the time about the great freedom the youth and the young people have. I mean, we had a far better youth. Yeah. And would you have felt limited in any way? I mean, w would you have felt limited in any way in your youth as, as a woman? Pardon, with a what? W would you have felt that you were limited in any way? I didn't bother thinking, it didn't enter her head about limit. That was life and that's the way you behaved and yeah. that's the way you were done. Yeah. You know, we didn't see, I can't see, like, that, uh, and I see it all around me now, too. All uh, You know, I don't see that the young people have any better life than we had. And if, you, if you're looking at, I suppose, I'm just thinking, teaching in, in a Dublin school in the, the 1950s and... Um, did, did you go into the 60s? No, you were still in Dublin in the... In I came home in, in, in 1960. I was actually going out to John when I came home. And I would say, I don't know if I would have stayed at home only for that because, like, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of things to, going on or a lot of things to go to, like, in those... There wasn't many young people around, you know, like, it was a whole crowd of us in Dublin, all but the one age group training together and knew other people and, you know. Yeah. And of course, there would have been a lot of emigration, probably of women from, you know, in in the nineteen fifties in Donegal. So there might not have been a lot of women. Well, there was a age. lot of emigration. I mean, that was one of the big things. Uh, you know, <laughs> people would be waiting at Christmas and Easter, and times would be, you know, more people at home, and there'd be more people at the dances, and it used to be kind of a topic: who was coming and who was going and who was away. You know that type of thing. Yeah. So having seen, I suppose I'm thinking in the 1950s and coming up to 1960, the state is sort of between, you know, 30 and 40 years old. And you're in this position where you had grown up hearing stories of that revolutionary time. 
and then you're in Dublin and you're teaching in a in a school in a kind of a uh, a disadvantaged area. Maybe there, there's probably tenements still on the go in or around that area. And I, I'm just wondering how I, what your observations were on how the Irish state was faring in general. You know what I mean? At that particular time, seeing the things that you saw when you were teaching in Dublin and then to go back to an area where there were so few young people. Well, it's hard to know. Like, I mean, it, it, it was always emigr. You know, emigration was part of Ireland. You know, always like, and uh, a lot of the, you know, I suppose just things did. You know, just around the time I came home, and that things did start from then on. Kind of, you know, mending up. There was a bit less of emigration and that type of thing. I mean, after the time we got married, then they. He came and started new schemes, came coming in environment schemes and different things, you know. I kind of people started uh, you know, place kind of changed quite a bit then, you know, a bit more prosperity and that. And um well in Dublin uh, the kind of the the people I suppose the society was quite segregated in a way. Like uh, the con people like uh, depend a good bit there where different people like where the people from the ch- parents of the children we would have had and that and that like we would never be at anything social that they were at like we went to the ba- national ballroom and uh, you know the different dancers and say the Donegal Association and uh, Barry's Hotel and uh, we went to sort of things that uh, they were mostly now people, country people in Dublin. A lot of them say we'd have known been the civil service, the guards, and you know that kind of thing. And and, uh, and I suppose the very wealthy would have been going to I suppose I don't know what, but uh, like uh, things uh, more expensive type of things that we wouldn't be going to, you know. And what was the Donegal Association in Dublin like at the time? Well, at the Donegal Association used to be dance every month. Now, uh, they had a committee as well, but now I, we never kind of went to the committee meetings or anything. We just would know the dance was on. I think it was every month or maybe every two months. But it would be on, like, and uh, we'd always go. And you'd always see some of the people from home, you know, and that um, there. Uh, and so you're... Remember, t- uh, there was just, uh, you know, like, then there was the libraries and there was so much just things you... You even went in around Yellow Shop on O'Connell Street, but for a while you could go through books, you know. And G- Gills was the big shop, was it? Uh, yeah, Gills, yeah, on O'Connell Street, that time was a big bookshop, yeah. Mm. And and tell me then, so you 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 return home in 1960 and teach in, in Frost's National School. That's right, yeah. And then a couple of years later, marry John. Yeah. And tell me about, I suppose, uh, teaching in Frost's National School. In, I suppose I'm thinking in the 1960s, you would have been teaching there around the time of the 50th anniversary of the 1916 Rising. Oh, yeah, 1966. Yeah, there was the kind of things around there that him, you know, from the depart- uh, government did send out posters and different things. And uh, at that time, though, I would have had the junior classes. There was only a two, you know, there was some two teacher schools. So, I mean, it didn't impinge an awful lot on the, you know, uh, on the um, infants in first and second class. Yeah, and who was the other teacher in the school when you were there teaching the senior classes? When I went there first, it was um, Aston McGrath. He actually had taught me, and he was just there for one year when he left. And then there was Master Coughlin. Now he would be the grandfather of that Mary Coughlin that was the tarnished you for a while. Yes, yes, yes. And his wife, uh, she, she, she was actually related to me and related to John. There will be quite a tradition of the same kind of group of families been married to other. You know, uh, further back, uh, more on, keeping on, there have been quite of, um, you know, about who would be allowed to marry who nearly. And uh, so there was just a kind of, I suppose, people were inclined to, if there was already some of the connection married, well, um, that would be a bit of a help, shall we say. And, and would it have been that they would have been in or around the same... 
I don't know. I know there's no class official class system in Ireland, but you know yeah, what I mean. Know, I that kind much, of so thing. Very much so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and would there have been a lot of people, I suppose, going for the priesthood and to join in convents and that sort of thing as well around that? Well, time? There, were, uh, there would be quite a lot of occasions. Mm. I had two. I had two sisters enter the convent. Really. Yeah. And where did I they enter? Be, uh, one of them's still in Dublin. She's out in Churchtown. The other one's dead. She died in England. She had spent some years out in Kenya. Wow. Mm. And that was a difficult life as well because they weren't allowed to really well, return home, were they? People didn't uh, kind of, uh, people thought it was uh, very nice that people were entering the convent. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you see, it probably, when you look at it, it was no harder than some of the ones who was away working as maids places and that. Of course, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I often amuse me now when I read, you know, sort of things people say about these things because... Life was quite regimented for a lot of other people as well. Yeah, I suppose we're looking at it through the lens of modern eyes, you know. There must be a name for that, that that way of looking at things that happened in the past with a light of the the present, ideas that the people hadn't thought of at all at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, there was quite a few, like there were two other girls in our townland entered the convent as well, and uh, there was a girl that worked here, mind the children, after we got married, after our first children, she entered the convent, she's out in Cape Town now. And would they have joined a particular order, the people from that part of the of Donegal? Was well, there... It just depended. Well, one of the things was, they used to go around the schools there too, different orders, you know, promoting and talking like and giving out leaflets and that type of thing. And uh, quite a few of the boys would have gone to the Christian Brothers. And your own children then were born in the 19, 1970s, would it have been? Oh, no, 19, 60, we were married in 63, UK yeah. was born in 64, Rosario was born in 66, Edward was born in 68, and then Roberta was born in 75. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. And they, they all would have, would they have gone to the school you were teaching in? They did, yeah. Yes. And my children, I uh, mentioned that Master Cough, and he then had retired, and then his son Cahill uh, became principal. And uh, Cahill was um, the same age as me, and uh, again, as I say, we were related to, um, he was related to John as well. And um, I always look back, it was a great time, you know, we're both of the same age group and the same outlook, and, you know, and our children were friendly and that. And that went on then until um, his brother Clement was in the dial and then Clement was killed in an accident. Cahill was persuaded to go forward and he was only three years in when um, he died. Gosh. Gosh. Then that's when Mary, the, the daughter, then she became the uh, TD for the area and then she was the first female tarnished in the history of the state. Yes. And was there, was there, tell me a little bit around that, was the, was that a, I suppose to have I, uh, her as the first woman, but also a Donegal person as Thánishta, was that, was that ah, yeah, that's, celebrated? Uh, the funny thing about uh, just talking about pol- and school and politics in general, for years now the children, there wouldn't be about, uh, they knew who was the president or the teacher would be just about, that would be about it. They weren't particularly interested. But when Clement Coughlin went up, for the Fianna Fáil candidate to local. The, the, area, <laughs> the children became politicised. You know, they all knew then about who parties and things that they never paid any heed to before, you know. Always there's a big kind of, uh, you know, every child, as I say, all, all they knew about politics that had paid no heed to it before. And how did, what was your approach to teaching history and, and I suppose, um, talking about politics with the children in the school? Well, you would just avoid um, getting too into one way or the other, you know, because there was no point, really. And uh, I I, I do remember the one thing, when I think of it now, uh, I was talking about um, Master, uh, it was off, the old Master, he was off sick, and uh, 
the sub was put in, so I let the sub do my room, and I went over to the master's room. And I remember getting them to uh, talking about, uh, do, I remember doing 1916 in the, sub, the Tan War and the Civil War, and I told, everybody was supposed to gather up information at home. And I remember that I was living at home at the times before I was married. I remember talking about it at home. My father thought, goodness me, you're going to get yourself into trouble. He just getting the children to gather up information he didn't think was a very wise idea at all. My Looking at it from my point of view that I could get into trouble. Wow. And did you? you? Know. <laughs> no, I didn't. It didn't go, I suppose. Nobody, some of them did take in bits of information and that was probably stuff we knew already and some of them didn't and that was that, like, you know. Yes, yes. But yes. I do remember him saying that. Like, I mean, this idea of children or anybody doing research and that just wasn't... Mm. You know, wasn't it just you taught history? You didn't send the children out to gather it up. <laughs> yeah. And would uh, you would have been teaching, of course, Helen throughout the Northern Irish Troubles? Yeah, well, I was. Yeah. And would would I suppose be, Donegal being a border county? Um, would I suppose what was that like being a teacher during those times, um, particularly when I suppose. <laughs> went on so long and it just yeah. became part and parcel of the life that was. There was an awful lot of uh, police activity around here because there was a family or two would have been uh, involved and uh, there was an awful lot of state money spent on cars touring about up here. When they thought they watched the drugs in Dublin I think it would have been better. Uh, but um, we do. You wouldn't just now, like we did the thing called the news at school came in as a topic for them. And, you know, I would always try to keep uh, international or news, but, you know, away from just the media farm and that. But um, you just would try to not to concentrate too much on it, like, you know, at school, like it was just. Hmm. And would you say that there would have been much activity um, of a Republican nature in or around that part of Donegal during and those years? Not really, not really. You know, it was, no, it was one or two people went to, were over in the north and got themselves into trouble over there. And the uh, biggest problem really was, you see, an issue went out of this county, out down at Bundorn there. Uh, and the other way to get out of the county, you had to go through the north. Like the express bus goes through the north to Dublin, like. And uh, there'll be a lot of stories like that about people being held up at the, you know, it was held up and people in cars being, and they give a man that was going over to the north, we'll say, you'd have to go over there good with that and for agricultural machinery and repairs and parts and that. They'd be inclined to take somebody with them. You know, you'd have just proof, you know, that there was more than one going, like, you know, be, you know, just people being held up and could be, and then there were stories of, we used to go busload of women over to shop in the north, and then they were telling about coming home and uh, there were some big holes up at the border. And they have, have had on the radio playing patriotic songs. Remember, people tell me, I said, you'd be far more patriotic if you would do your shopping at home <laughs> and not bother going over to the north and putting on the radio. But you had a good bit of that. You know, I mean, if, I often felt that, that people would be talking patriotic. And, you know, over between their shop in the north, like, you know, that I just often felt that a lot of that. And would any of, of I suppose, um, you know, uh, the, your, the, the previous generation to you and your family have been alive still when the troubles broke out? Um, like your, your your parents or John's parents were... were I hope my father was, yeah, they were, they were alive, yeah. And and I suppose I'm just curious about what that generation's views were on on what was happening in the north and the conflict. And I suppose having well, been, just, I think their main basic view was they weren't one bit surprised. You know, they just the stories of all the you know the um, Jerry Mandarin and things that had gone on in the north down the years would be well known. But on the other hand, the people that had people, relations farming in the north, you see, they got into schemes and things far quicker than we did. Mm. And they were quite, um, they were quite happy with the situation the way it was. Yeah, I was going to ask that about farming in particular. 
Yeah, yeah well, farming and protector, yeah. yeah. People uh, that had people, people that were in farming in the north, they, they had got to such schemes and were getting on a lot better than the farmers here were. And they were quite, I mean, you see, that was a lot of things in the north were politicised. Those people were quite content. If, if things in the north had been a bit, uh, evened up a bit better, you know, not such just blatant gerrymandering and that, I, mean, I don't I think those people were quite content. A lot of And would you have travelled over to the north much during that period? I, um, I remember like when we were going to, like, to get, uh, look, there weren't many tractor dealers or that in the county. I remember my husband being over riders, we over Newton Stewart, and I used to go with them for the run because there wasn't many places to go. And uh, down to Derry times, you know, for parts and that, Linton and Robinson and Japan. People had to because I don't know where far up the other way up into the Republic you would have to go. I remember them going to Calvin for tractors and she had to go through the north. And can you remember ever being held up at the border? Pardon? Can you remember any times where you were held up at the border? I, will, I remember being on the express bus, coming down a few times, and the uh, police would come in and they'd go to the, or the soldiers and ask you for your passport. Well, I just wouldn't have my passport with me because I didn't see any need to. There wasn't anything more they could do without it, like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. And, and sometimes, like, there'd be stops and they'd see the, you know, the bus would wave the bus on and then others, the soldiers would be quite contrary because they knew it was a bus airing. Mm. They wouldn't be, neither, you know, they wouldn't mind holding it up for a while. Mm. But the drivers were always very diplomatic now and always, you know, make sure that they didn't raise any controversy or anything. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Amused me. I remember one night coming up on the express, and um, they used to change drivers in the skeleton. But because, oh, I get there too many. I forget why the Dublin driver had to drive on. Was going to have. Oh, this happened in Calvin. He, he was going to have to drive on to um, Johnny God. Well, you would think he was going to have to go to the moon. And I was sitting in the front seat, and then we, he came up. I had no idea. I had to get the guide him into the skill and then out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I was used on the bus. And, uh, you know, they had a kind of a firework. Like we were used to it. We didn't pay a lot of heed to it. Yes. Uh, you know, but they like, had remember that, like to him, you think he was sent to Mars when he was told he had to go, on to, to, he had to go through the north to go to Donegal. Like, yeah. And I often remember even being on tours on the continent a couple of times or places, and you'd meet up with people, Americans, and they had been doing Europe. Oh, no, they didn't go to Ireland. They couldn't go there. Look at the trouble. And I remember, you know, talking about it to people, and I would say, well, not sure. Every time I go to Dublin, I have to go through the north. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and tell me, I suppose, I think, um, the experience of being a, living in a border county um, and the... I suppose it would during times of the, where there was sort of major atrocities during the troubles um, or major things that happened, would like, would you say that there was it increased the tension or how were relationships between well, Catholics and Protestants? I would say and that it would maybe increase it a wee bit. You see, there was stories, too, that some of the locals were be specials in the north that they were going over. You know, acting to be special and got in that way into the north, you know, in the north, like. But uh, still, the people just kind of kept on the same. Now, I there was the nearest non Catholic family to me up here. And I was always very friendly up and down in it. The woman used to was a dressmaker and you go up and down and chatting and, you know, we're never any. But I would think it did a kind of increase the Protestant identity a wee bit. They say their attendance at church uh, went up a good bit in that. You know, that's that, you, know, yeah. you know, identifying themselves as a community, like, you know. Yes, yes. That they became maybe more solidified or unified. Yeah, as a I would think that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. a lot of them didn't like the, you know, a lot of the trouble. They would, some of them at least would say that if things had been done a bit fairer in the North, there never would be enough of it. So I suppose um, we are in the middle of what they call the decade of centenaries. Um, yeah. looking back on 100 years ago and the various aspects of what happened in, in that decade 100 years ago 
what are what are your thoughts on the commemorations um, and how things should be commemorated or how do you think it's going? Well, I would think back, first of all, when the talk came up about com- commemorating the plantation of Ulster. I said to, um, so you go to the uh, Ulster Federation meetings times, and I was saying to them, you know, that to start up an Ulster commemorating the plantation didn't seem to me to be a very good idea. But they said, you know, that, you know, well, they were going to be commemorated anyway. And now there will be cross border, cross community, the Ulster Federation. And uh, it turned out all right. Like, you know, it didn't cause any. Um, it's hard uh, so far as commemorating now has gone on all right. Uh, I don't know now about the Civil War, I suppose. Well, we got through, like, but. Um, it's not fair, I suppose, one way to disregard the things. And then it's just hard at times to know how the balance will be kept, on the other hand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because, there, like you were saying, there's. it seems from what you were saying and from what some other people have been saying, there's um, there was a considerable amount of silence around that. There was an all well, there was and that program then they came on that program about uh Aigna or Mara, the, the, the sexual violence for women. Yes. It was on there. Uh I think we felt that uh, they weren't fit to dig up very much altogether when they went to it. I, I personally don't think there would have been a lot of it. Because I mean, there, there were such crowds, it's all, you know, when they went to a house, there was a crowd in the house, and there were several of them. I don't, I, I don't actually think it would have featured in, uh, at, much at all in the, uh, in, in the wars at all. And I just think, uh, you know, now trying to uh, even add in more, if possible, anything that would be more sensational isn't going to help. And do you think that, I suppose, do you think that the commemorations have, in general, though, um, I suppose, helped to right the balance a little bit in terms of well, I do. the story I of women. Yeah, there's a lot of things spoken about and no one now that weren't no one. And, uh, you know, and people who are forgotten and, uh, you know, are being commemorated, I do think that that is a good thing, like, you know. I suppose I'm thinking about coming the mind. So, yes, um, no, I think... Yeah. People talk two times all as one as, uh, you know, kind of we should nearly apologise for the past. And uh, I mean, every other country fought for its independence. You know, people now, the idea of pacifism is actually was unknown. And uh, people are talking now, you know, about pacifism and that to fight, the, you know, anything in that nature was bad and people should be apologising for it. And I mean, I don't see any point in that. I mean, that history had happened and that's, and it's, we, we're not unique. I mean, that's the thing I always find very much too. And a lot of uh, programs and things that are put on, uh, they're never kind of um, put into a, a, a context any wider than the Irish context. Yes. You know, yes. um, you see, you see, talk, talking about, we'll say, the church in the 1930s. Well, you know, we're talking about in an age when you had fascism and communism and all these things in Europe. But that's never kind of put into the context at all. I think that, uh, you know, if things were being done, if it could be looked at in a more broad context, uh, worldwide, uh, things were in everywhere else in the world at that time. Yeah. And I suppose uh, along that vein, then, um, you know, I suppose there there were a significant number of commemorations for Irish people who were in involved and lost their lives in World War One in the last few years and would that have been I suppose remembered or commemorated or were there many people from your area who would have um, had aware enlisted and I mean it was Paddy Hart from Donegal that got a lot of that going yes I know Paddy I know the daughter um, the um, well uh, first of all of course they went it, it was recommended by the uh, people in Ireland at the time that they go so therefore, I don't think, you know, that they should have been, um, 
blamed or looked down on for it. I do think this probably the country went a bit too far, you know, uh, ignoring them or casting aspersions on them, you know, when the free state was set up. Like, I don't think that was kind of, I would think that. Was. But then you had extremism all, you know, kind of. Another thing, too, was the time of World War II. Uh, a lot, uh, quite a few of the uh, generals in the British Army were, uh, were uh, Ulster Scots, not forgetting the old General Montgomery. And, uh, it was never put in a paper. You see, the papers, that was kind of officially ignored, their Ulster background. I mean, I don't think that was fair. I remember my father, great interest in the war, and we loved to be reading about General Montgomery and all. And yes. as a child, and there was papers around the house, <clears throat> still like, and they would talk, you know. Yes. But uh, I think that kind of, uh, I suppose the state would have gone a bit too far like that. But then, in the national context of other countries, when you look at the day where they were going and what, yes. you know, yes. countries were very inclined to uh, push their own agenda. And I suppose the the agenda really of of that of the of the state in the in the beginning of the twentieth I suppose the first half of the twentieth century certainly what, what what would you say the agenda actually was of 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 the state and what do you think I suppose in terms of creating a an Irish identity or what type of state do you think I think that was kind of very much try to get us away as far as we could from our colonial past and uh, to be a, a nation once again. And uh, that I would say that, uh, you know, politicians use the things as well. I mean, for an election platform to get up and give out a big partition was, you know, a bit of a vote puller and that kind of thing, you know. And I, I suppose I'm curious, um, you know, given that there's always been this sort of like, you know, division in, in Irish politics between Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, what your thoughts are on the current coalition? Oh, well, <laughs> I've been listening for a lifetime to people going on on one side or the other. Uh, I think uh, I, I just say that at last we might see the end to civil war politics. And do you think, do you I think, think that, that is... Be a good thing? Yeah, I was just going to ask, do you think that this is the start of the end of civil war politics? Well, I would say when this generation goes, like my, like, I mean, I would have friends, I mean, some of my friends are married to county councillors and TDs and what or not. And, you know, like I would, uh, you know, hear a bit about politics from them, like, and uh, I just I have to laugh now when I see, you know, this, that ones have spent their lifetime giving out about um, being a file or finding gate. Uh, or practically nothing, you know, very minor things, really. That I do think that, uh, you know, if we had an end to civil war politics, that would be a very good thing. I, I mean, it's not doing anybody any good, or it's not really, apart from being of a historical importance, uh, uh, there's nothing else to do with it now. And um, another thing I think, and I don't suppose it's very politically correct to say it, but... Uh, like, I don't like this idea either of Fianna Fáil going on giving out about Sinn Féin and his uh, military past, because they would have military past as well. And when they start going on, I think it's rather silly of them not to realise that. Like, And I suppose in, in your lifetime, Helen, so you were born in 1937, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And what would you say the, the biggest developments have been that you have seen in your lifetime or the biggest changes or the biggest moments kind of in Irish history, you know, from a historian's eye, looking back at your own lifetime? Well, I would think one of the big things, I think, but then like, everything goes too far. The, I would think the change, like joining the European Union, that was a very good thing at the beginning because it was a trade thing. But I'm not greatly in favour of of, you know, like Big Brother EU now. I would feel that people, the people, uh, you know, they're keep, uh, keeping their national identity a bit better. It was grand, I would look on it as a trade, uh, uh, you know, thing, but not for um, too much uh, bureaucracy. 
you know, you have a system now, say, uh, rules about agriculture. Uh, they made over in Brussels. And they make a rule that you only can spread slurry. I don't know if your agricultural background or not. Uh, spread slurry on the land from such an eight to such an eight. Mm-hmm. In reality, on the part of you here, you wouldn't get a sack or on the field that thing. Then if you have a few slurries overflowing goes out into the river, then you're liable for pollution. You know, you can be summoned for that. And uh, there's too much bureaucracy, central bureaucracy, that matters of that type all should be left to the country where they correlate. Mm-hmm. So I feel that what started out as a good idea, like uh, European Union and trade union and all that, I think that, um, you know, to be trying to make everyone accept uh, uh, the liberal agenda of uh, the EU isn't a great, you know, isn't uh, helping really. And it's causing in Europe, and it may cause here, uh, groups now rising up in opposition and being extreme in that. I know it's not, I see, uh, like, uh, I remember, you know, the McGill Summer School in Dente, the big thing, Joe Mulholland Summer School. And uh, there was some of the debating about the EU and that, and Joe was up talking, I'm very friendly with Joe, we launched one of the books. And... Um, he was talking about how great the EU was and all the free literature was available on it. That's what he was talking about. But like for somebody that has obeyed by these minor rules uh, uh, in the clim- Irish climate, all the free literature is not much good to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, like uh, as I say, that would be the biggest change kind of I would have seen now, this uh, mm. kind of central bureaucracy, like, you know, come in from Europe. And what what would you say um, yourself, Helen, is the the legacy of the period nineteen twelve to nineteen twenty three? Well, it gave the country its freedom, and uh, I believe in the right to self determination of you know um, every country for its thing. And uh, whereas I don't like war, I can't see people blaming. Ireland for uh, having a revolution and everybody else having revolutions as well and blaming Ireland only. Well, that would be, uh, I would think that it would give the country its independence. I do think the country made bad use of its independence. But, you know, the country was entitled to it. Uh, I don't see any point in being down either on, uh, like people say, you know, say take the plantation of Ulster. There's no point in blaming now uh, you know, saying the plantation shouldn't have been. That's just a fact of history and you have to just accept it. And, you know, that, that's that. Like, that's the way history plays out. And uh, it was in reality, it was a lot longer ago, the Celts took over Ireland. And when you say that you, the country made bad use of its independence, what can you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, God, I don't know where to start. <laughs> uh, he, uh, well, I suppose um, people would it's been shown now, you know, that um, a lot of the things uh, applying of rules and uh, uh, made, made very little, uh, you know, for, for a lot of the people, it, it didn't always have no benefit really apart from that you had political independence but um, you know financially in that this country was a long time pulling up and the kind of the values of um, you know keep, keeping the books right and uh, not having uh, you know getting into debt and uh, it took a long time sort of for the country to get it on its feet and uh, a lot of things that have happened since there I do think you know uh, you know, like even take salaries of the top people in the country and, uh, you know, the dividing out of wealth and now you have all these kind of rules and, uh, you know, I think just a lot of things could have been managed a wee bit better. Yes. You know, and uh, on the other hand, then it has kind of led to... Um, a kind of a culture to, you know, there was very strict 
back. Now, you see, I'm talking just now about the flying column I mentioned way back. Like, my father used to say there were certain houses, uh, safe houses. Now, here was one of them. That was okay. The people here were fit to carry it. But, you know, you know, there were safe houses where the people were quite poor off. And my father always spoke with one case in particular. And that when it came then to getting compensation or getting the pensions or whatever it came, all these thick kind of rules and they just fell down on some box or other. And, uh, you know, there were people that could easily have done with it. You know, there was kind of um, a very kind of a just authoritarian state then come in like. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't say this so far, a long way <coughs> removed from the compassionate society. Yes, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, that kind of uh, very, you know, just just for things, you know, like is, I mean, to, to the, a lot of the people saw no difference. Say in the RUC when they were around the RAC and the the guard there when they came along, you know, it was just a very very authoritarian type of state with very little um, used to be made, say, the compassionate society and only that the most immigration was a safety valve, really. Yeah. And um, even on then, as better things came in and, you know, people now, where I just live here, now they're doing a massive job on the N56 going from Donegal Town down to Killebegs. It doesn't need quite of that money spent on it. That money could be spent on the minor roads and on different things. You know, what kind of a, people see an you know, awful kind of a, a waste in that, is, you know, for for the life of the average citizen. That there's not, um, the country just didn't. And I think it was things like that were worse in the past, really, you know, the more authoritarian way of going and no redress kind of. And, and then, of course, a lot of talk, too, about um, housing and that nowadays. Well, I don't know, to be honest, if I believe that it's the duty of the state. I mean, one thing when we get married, get inside to see if you've got somewhere to live, you know, yourself, like. And uh, but, uh, I think the wealth and the, that of the country, you know, has been very has been poorly divided. The country state now did very well in some ways and looks very well and good looks good in the world and all that kind of thing. But I just do think in many ways that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, we could have um, just that better use could have been made of our independence. Like. And I suppose we're at a, we're at a kind of a, an interesting time in history or uh, now, <laughs> you know, in that I suppose we, we spoke already about Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael being in coalition. And we also have we're in the middle of a pandemic, of course, and then Brexit is on the horizon as well. Um, you know, it, it's a nobody could have predicted that 100 years on and, uh, uh, you know, that this this would be what things look like. Are, are you hopeful about the future? How do you feel about all of that? Well, I think about Brexit that I, I'm sorry that England made the break, made an effort to have the break so soon. Because in every country, there's what I've spoken about already, loosening up a bit, you know, a bit more national autonomy. Surely I'll keep a trade agreement, you know, when I, kind of, but um, <clears throat> every country would have some kind of a group that would like the rules loosened up a bit, shall we say. And if Britain had awaited and the, that movement got in, on its feet, and other countries in Europe a bit better, and all push for that. But by Brexit, them doing a runner on their own kind of has let me, it's going to make it more difficult for any country now to get any kind of loosening up of the rules at all. Like, And um, Helen, I'm conscious I've kept you a long time this morning. Is, are, oh, is there that's all right. I enjoy chatting to nobody else to chat to. <laughs> It'll pass the time, sure. Um, <laughs> it passes the time. Um, yeah. Is is there anything I haven't asked you about, uh, Helen, that you would like to talk about or any other aspects, you know, um, that you think should be said about this particular period and its legacy? I think now, like, you know, uh, there is a good bit of, um, you know, say, a good bit has been written. And I would say now that so far that it has, uh, you know, done the country well, you know, that 
we hadn't had to go on too much about we should apologise because we had a rise in our, you know, some of these, um, what's this, Kevin Myers, what's this he was on about, I can't remember now. Uh, but, uh, you know, that way, the people aren't condemning the country as such in the light of more modern ideas of it, pacifism and that type of thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, pacifism is all right, but if it's not much good, you've been a pacifist if uh, nobody else is. Yes. And uh, I remember it reminds me of something my father used to say when there used to be these cases on about Sinn Féin or the IRA back in his time and about they didn't recognise the court. And my father used to say there wasn't much good in you not recognising the court when the court was recognising you. <laughs> that was it. Well, Helen, you've certainly contributed so much to uh, our knowledge about the history of, of that period and of, of Donegal through your books and all of your articles and lectures. And um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to you for your time this morning in, in sharing some of your thoughts with me and your memories. It's, it's been absolutely super. So thanks so much for giving me so much of your time. I really appreciate it.